we talk about Terraform, everything sort of started with the practitioner with the open source tool, right? It was really how do we solve that problem of doing multi-cloud provisioning in an infrastructure as code way that's going to be simple and expand to sort of multiple clouds and providers, right? From there, we heard from a lot of our users and customers that they wanted to use Terraform in an enterprise setting, but they had a whole different set of challenges. How do they connect it back to audit logging and single sign-on and policy-based management and role-based access controls? There's a ton of sort of scaffolding needed around the open source tool to make that work in an enterprise setting. And then for folks in the middle, this left a major gap, right? How do you collaborate with your peers if you're not in a regulated corporate setting? Maybe you don't need Terraform Enterprise. It's too big. And so I think what we started, announced last year was Terraform Cloud along with the free tier to start to solve this problem, right? Much like GitHub provides a shared notion of sort of a master branch for a development team, what Terraform Cloud does is provide a shared set of state so that you have a master notion of what your infrastructure looks like, right? It becomes a point of collaboration just like GitHub does for development. And so last year we announced this Terraform Cloud along with its free tier which provided just that sort of centralized state storage. For folks who have used Terraform, I know in the past you might have used remote state storage and console and uh, S3 buckets and things like that, but we wanted a more first class experience. So what I'm super excited to announce today is a major expansion to the feature sets and capabilities of the free tier. So there's sort of a few things that I want to touch on here. One is the state storage, which we talked about last year. It's still a part of it. But now we're actually bringing in remote abilities to do plan and applies, right? The full sort of Terraform workflow within Terraform Cloud. So now when you run Terraform plan or apply locally, it'll actually be executing it server side in a centralized way, right? And so what this allows you to do is connect the experience of the command line, where it's unchanged, to now a web interface where you and your peers can see what's actually happening, what's the history of those changes, to an API which will allow you to do all those same things. So you get the full workflow, but now you can access it in multiple different ways and collaborate with a team as opposed to just on your machine. In addition, the other big problem is how do we start to share and have these repeatable patterns in terms of you know, working together, right? So we'll talk about the private module registry in a second here. So what does this actually look like, right? If we look at the command line of sort of Terraform for running a local plan, it looks exactly the same as before, right? And this is by design, nothing changes, right? Your local workflow is sort of unaltered, right? When you're using Terraform Cloud, Terraform works just as you would expect, right? In some sense, nothing changes. The command line acts as sort of a terminal to, to sort of the API behind the scenes, and it's invoking the right APIs for you transparently, but the user experience is unmodified. But what happens then is now you can see that exact same run happening in real time in the dashboard. So you and your peers can see it, you can comment on it, you can collaborate on it. There's a history of it that operates sort of like the git commit history, right? You can log in and sort of do the git blame, right? How did this change get made? When did it happen? Who made the change? Why did they do it? What's the git commit that it ties back into? So it gives you the sort of way of understanding how these changes happened in a central view. This is a view if you zoom out then to looking at sort of multiple workspaces, right? What ends up happening often with Terraform is people start with a relatively small configuration and it grows with complexity organically over time until it becomes these giant configurations, right? And these become difficult to manage. They become higher risk when you're making a change that takes longer for applies to take place because there's so many resources under management. And so one of the things we want to encourage is a more de granular decomposition. Right? In some sense, there's an analogy to be made to the microservice architecture, which is you don't want one monolithic application. You want many smaller services. Same with Terraform. You don't want one massive configuration. You want many smaller workspaces that you compose together. And each of these then becomes safer to work with, smaller blast radius, easier to reason about, but you can compose them into a large infrastructure. Right? So Terraform Cloud gives you this ability to think in terms of these smaller chunks and compose them together easily. Right? One of the advantages as we think about shifting into this mode, right, is we don't want to break the local workflow, but how do we get out of the business of distributing, let's say, AWS credentials to all of our developers, right? Instead, we can define those centrally, put them in as a variable to our execution, and those will get filled into Terraform just in time for the execution. But we can mark them as sensitive. We don't have to distribute them to the whole team. If we need to rotate or revoke them, we can do that in a central way, right? And so it puts a central place where we can manage these things rather than having to worry about distributing credentials and settings uh, to everyone in our team. The final kind of component of this is the private module registry, right? So we've had the Terraform public module registry uh, for a few years, and it has thousands of modules that 
sort of have the best practice ways of getting started with defining networks and middleware and common application architectures. And this is great if you're willing to build a pattern and share it for the whole community. But what if you want to take one of those and modify it in a way that makes sense for your business, your context, right? It might not be appropriate to share that with sort of the whole world. And so this is where the private module registry helps, right? You can build your own modules that are designed for internal distribution, right? So it might be tweaks that only make sense within your environment. You can capture all those, put them, and share them internally. And just like the public module registry operates the same way, just with a different set of visibility and controls. And so I'm super excited that all of this is available today. All right, you can log in today. If you have an account already, you can log in. It's all there. If you don't yet, visit terraform.io. You can follow the link and register and get started with the free tier. So one of the challenges when we talk about sort of the free team collaboration is over time, you're going to add more users, right? You're going to get to a bigger state where then your problem changes a little bit, right? When it's a few users, you're not as worried about things like security or policy or consistency. It's only a handful of people, right? But as you get bigger, you do worry about, like, should everybody have the ability to modify my core network systems, right? Should everybody be able to change the core, you know, shared databases? Or do we want to have more fine-grained access, right? Maybe app teams can modify their infrastructure, but core networking is handled by someone else. Shared databases are handled by someone else. And we want to be able to share that, but without sort of giving away the keys to the kingdom. And similarly, we might want a consistent enforcement of policy, right? What instance sizes are we allowed to use? What regions are we allowed to deploy? And what times of day can changes be made? And so this is a different set of challenge that we really look at solving with sort of a different tier of Terraform Cloud. And so I'm excited, as part of that, to talk about Terraform Cloud for Teams. So when we talk about Terraform Cloud for Teams, it sort of adds on top of the free tier and looks at slightly a different set of challenges, right? Which is how do we define a set of teams and provide different sets of permissions to them in terms of who is allowed to make what types of changes in a fine-grained way? And it allows us to collaborate with sort of an unlimited number of people. It also changes the module registry to bring in role-based access control. So you might want some people who are allowed to publish the modules and other people who are only allowed to consume, right? And lastly, it also exposes the Sentinel, our policy as code engine, for doing that sort of fine-grained policy. Right? So what this looks like is what you would expect, right? Very similar to something like GitHub. You can define a set of teams and then govern what they're allowed to do. So you might say my core network team, they're allowed to define and modify the network, while everybody else, they can read it. They need to know what's my VPC ID and the subnet IDs and things like that, but they shouldn't be able to modify any of that, right? With the Sentinel engine as well, you can define very fine-grained policy, things like allowable regions, allowable instance sizes, times of day that you can deploy, et cetera. And you can install these in different modes, right? Whether they're hard mandatory and there's no way to escape them, right? Might be a security thing like don't open the firewall to the whole internet. Or if they're simply advisory, like, hey, this instance type is deprecated, you should probably stop using it, right? We're not gonna stop you, but here's a heads up. So this is all part of our sort of sentinel engine, and this gets exposed as well. And so with this, we sort of round out thinking about these different layers, right? Terraform starts with the individual practitioner and that's where it grows from, right? You start there and goes into then sort of a smaller size teams. And from there, if we succeed, you end up using it at you know, hundreds or thousands of users at the sort of enterprise tier. So now there's kind of multiple ways to get started. With Terraform Cloud Free Tier, we want it to be super easy to get started. It's free, you register today. And at some point in there, you might transition to a larger team where you start with Terraform Cloud for Teams, which is $20 a user a month. And from there, if you get really large, you know, we're happy to chat with you about Terraform Enterprise if you need things like single sign-on, single tenancy, hosting it behind your firewall, and things like that. And so part of our goal here was really thinking about how do we have a consistent Terraform user experience? I think with some of you who have been using it for a few years might have seen that Terraform's user experience sort of changed at every scale. Whether you, when you started day one, to you had a team and you had to cobble together something in a CI-CD pipeline, to you try to figure out how do you sort of wrap policy around it at scale, the challenges sort of force you to break your workflow. And so this was really a key thing for us, was really going back to that sort of the Tao of HashiCorp, the notion that workflow is kind of our most important thing, and thinking about how do we make that consistent? How do we not break it, even as you go from one user to 1,000 users? And so this is really part of that sort of standardization and making that a really clean, simple journey. So we're excited for you to try it and excited to have your feedback. So when we talk about Terraform, we're often talking about sort of provisioning as a life cycle. Right? And what I mean by that is, you know, it starts with a day one. Right? Day one is what most people kind of mean when they talk about provisioning. 
it's going from nothing to something, right? I want to go from I have nothing running to I want my initial network and VMs and things like that, right? And in many ways, this is sort of the simplest problem, right? There's kind of nothing to mess up. There's no users, there's no data, there's nothing running, right? So the worst you can do is fail to set it up, right? So this is kind of the luxury, easy problem, right? As you get to day two, this is when life gets more challenging, right? You have an existing infrastructure, and now you want to evolve it, right? You're going to scale up, scale down, change a config, et cetera. But now there's users, there's data, there's live production traffic, right? So this is a much more challenging problem because now there's risk, but it's the problem you have every day outside of day one, right? And so this is where we spend a lot of time and attention on things like Terraform plan to make sure that you have the confidence to understand what's going to happen before it happens to give you fine-grained ways of making changes and give sort of operator confidence. And then there's ultimately day N, right? You have an existing set of infrastructure, but you don't need it anymore, right? Maybe it's a testing environment. Maybe it's a service that you're turning down. But you want to go from something back to nothing, right? And in this sense, you complete the life cycle, right? You went from nothing back to nothing, right? Sort of cradle to grave. And so I think when you think about Terraform in that lens as a life cycle, it becomes clear that it's sort of an ongoing activity, right? It's not something you do one time, day one, and then you sort of forget about it, right? You're kind of managing it much like code. It becomes a living, breathing thing, right? And so if you think about it through that lens, provisioning doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? It's connected to other things in our infrastructure. It's connected to the day-to-day -day of how we work together, right? And so one of the goals is how do we enable Terraform not just to be a day one provisioning tool, to be be a platform that's sort of part of your infrastructure and part of your life cycle. So we kind of look at the ecosystem around Terraform. There's, you know, the southbound side in some sense is probably what people are most familiar with, right? This is where I'd put the Terraform providers, right? Whether you have the major cloud providers, whether you have, you know, big on-premise vendors like, you know, VMware and Nutanix and F5 and Cisco, whether you have sort of PaaS like Kubernetes or SaaS like Datadog and New Relic and GitHub. The providers are what ter allow Terraform to sort of integrate with this whole universe and manage sort of 250 different sort of types of providers today, right? So there's always been a concerted effort on how do we grow that ecosystem and really support everything that you might want to manage as code. But then if we talk about the northbound side, it's not about technology and infrastructure, it's about workflow, right? It's how do I actually go about making these changes? What's the environment in which I'm working? And there the focus is on things like uh, version control systems, right? GitHub and GitLab and Bitbucket, right? So where am I starting my infrastructure as code journey? Oftentimes in version control, right? But then you might have a set of CI CD practices that you build around it. So how do we integrate with Circle and Jenkins and Travis and all of the kind of major CI platforms that you might want to use? And similarly, how do I collaborate, right? Is that in Slack? Is it in other sort of mediums? Do I have to use things like you know, ServiceNow to do approvals for changes, right? What are the workflow pieces that I need to really integrate this into how I get things done, right? And so our goal is really to start focusing on not just the southbound side, but the northbound side, and really create a rich ecosystem around Terraform. And so when we think about Terraform, there's sort of multiple inputs, right? There's things that might want to trigger it. There's things upstream that Terraform might want to notify. And there's systems that might want to interact with it on the southbound, right? So if we think about triggering, one major thing is version control systems, right? I make a change and I want to automatically trigger a Terraform plan or a Terraform apply from that. And so today we have tight integrations with GitHub and GitLab and Bitbucket and more coming. But what about organizations who maybe aren't ready to go full infrastructure as code, right? These are organizations who are maybe used to a more ticket-driven sort of approach. They're using you know, an IT service management system. And so how do we meet those people halfway, right? How do we give them some of the benefits of infrastructure as code without expecting them to fully abandon the way they work today? And so one of the major integrations in the last year that we're super excited about is ServiceNow, right? So for users of ServiceNow, they might be more comfortable going through a UI and using sort of a point-and-click ticket-driven interface. But now what Terraform Cloud enables you to do is basically automate the fulfillment of it. So you can expose a service catalog of different services, maybe a Java MySQL app, for example, and the user can come in and basically request this, right? But although it sort of looks like requesting a ticket, the back end of the fulfillment is automated, right? So this kicks the job out and uses the Terraform templates to actually do the execution and the, the sort of provisioning. And so the benefit for these organizations is they eliminate that sort of multi-week wait for infrastructure, but without totally disrupting their workflow. Now, what about the things that Terraform needs to talk to, 
right? Provisioning doesn't just end when the infrastructure comes up. There's a bunch of upstream services that we might want to connect with, right? One of the things that we've heard sort of loud and clear is that you want Terraform where you actually collaborate, right? So there's now native Slack integration. So you can get notifications anytime a plan gets scheduled or an apply completes or an approval is needed. And so you can collaborate where you're sort of already working, right? There's sort of a whole host of upstream services that you might want to talk to, right? And so this is where having sort of a rich set of webhook comes in, is you can use this to integrate with either other ISV technology partners, custom software you build in-house, simply gluing together different pipelines with CI CD solutions, but it lets you really bake Terraform into a broader ecosystem of automation, right? And so this is really how we think in terms of how do you enable this to be sort of a piece of a larger puzzle. And so before we move on from Terraform, there's sort of like one more thing in this ecosystem that I want to talk about. When we talk about kind of the initial goal of Terraform, it was how do I enable the provisioning to take place, right? And the focus here was the Terraform open source tool, its infrastructure as code as a philosophy, and it's a pluggable, extensible set of providers, right? From there, it sort of opens up a new set of problems, right? Which is like, how do I manage the risk of this? Great, now I have people who are provisioning infrastructure in the cloud, they're doing whatever they want. Right? How do I make sure whatever they want isn't sort of going against what I want, which is I don't want open firewall rules and I don't want people deleting my core networks. Right? And so you know, this becomes sort of a multifaceted approach. It's things like role-based access controls. It's granular workspaces to reduce risk. It's Sentinel and policy as code to define sort of a sandbox. So it's how do we lower the risk that things that we don't want to have happen, happen. But then this opens up sort of the next challenge, which is great. We've sort of defined a sandbox in which we can do things We've enabled people to provision, but oops, we provisioned a whole lot of things that we're not using, and we left them running. Or did we really need the quadruple extra large with the TPUs for our dev box, right? So there's a bunch of costs that starts to sort of accumulate that can become sort of shadow, right? And so I'm super excited today to announce cost estimation in Terraform Cloud and Terraform Enterprise. So as a quick sneak peek of what this looks like, cost estimation runs in sort of a workflow step in between the plan and apply phase. So you write your infrastructure as code, you run your Terraform plan and apply just like normal, and in between those two phases, Terraform will analyze what your configuration is and make a best guess of what this is gonna cost, right? So it's gonna look at the actual resource definitions and understand, okay, what will this cost on an hourly or monthly basis, right? What's the point estimate of this apply? And what's the delta from your existing infrastructure, right? So this starts to give you visibility into, oops, did I really intend to introduce that much cost? But it also lets us annotate these workspaces with those estimates and give you some idea, okay, if I have hundreds of workspaces, where does my cost sit, right? How did I get to this one sum picture that I get at the end of the month in a bill, but where is that cost really originating, right? And so unfortunately, I don't have time to go deeper into this today. I would encourage you all, if you're interested, to check out the keynote by Paul and Robbie later this afternoon. They're gonna go much deeper into sort of all the announcements and uh, all the kind of latest and greatest with Terraform. But again, all of this stuff is available today, everything I talked about, right? So the free tier stuff, all the new teams, cost estimation, it's all available. Go to terraform.io, sign up and register 